well. Wow. Dev- DevOps UK, eh? Hey? I do this every year, and it's the same thing. And I'm exhausted, and I'm sure you are too. So we're going to end, almost the end of the conference, on a high note. I'm just going to scare you. Okay. So you can tell what this talk is about. Uh, I don't have to repeat that. Uh, my name is Steve Poole. I work for a company called Sonatype. And I'll talk about those in just a second. Um, my background is a long, many, many years of Java, JVMs and stuff, sec- doing security, DevOps and things. But mostly I'm a JVM engineer. And my claim to fame is having sort of started before it was even won, which means that I've been doing it since some of, before some of you were born, which is really scary. Okay. <laughs> right. We're going to talk about AI, talk about cybercrime. We'll see how they connect together. Uh, and just explore the space and then end up with something that you could do, or at least get your head around, that might, <laughs> might help mitigate some of these things. So I work for this company. Anybody know the brand names? A few of you, okay. Uh, but you all use Maven Central, yeah? Every year. So we run Maven Central. We've been running Maven Central since it was created because it was created by the same people who created Sonotype, who created Maven the tool, etc. So... We do that for the community, among other things. So we do other stuff, right? All right, so let's start with the background. Let's talk about the bad guy, because without the bad guys, there's no story. So what are the bad things the bad guys are doing? They're doing a lot of bad stuff, and they've been doing it for a long time. And as you'll see in a minute, adding AI to the mix makes it more exciting. The first thing to do is get your head around the scale. Because bad guys aren't 14-year-old hackers. Bad guys are professional developers. Bad guys go to conferences. Bad guys learn things. Bad guys participate in open source projects, right? Because the money that they make is enormous. So in 2016, a few years ago, the amount of money that they made, which was about $450 billion dollars, would have bought you about 2 million houses in the UK. 2023, not that far away, they could have bought maybe half the houses in the UK. Now, this year, is up to about 83%. This year, we're talking, because I can't remember what the pounds, about £7 trillion of, of money being stolen. 2025 is looking to be at about 133%. And now think about that. That's how much money is being taken by these bad guys around the world, right? This isn't just for us. This is taking all the money and applying us. So you can see the consequences. This is what the big problem is, is that they're stealing so much money, right? Bad. But it's worse than that. Because they're also trying to compromise our systems. We're beyond this being a thing for money. We're now into a world where it's about cyber warfare. Because what people have realized is is that all the weapons you you can use to steal money can be used to compromise systems for other reasons. Like uh, fake news, of course. Fake news is great. But more invisibly, we'll be getting into your infrastructure, the infrastructure of your country, getting into all of the businesses that you work in because you interact with each other. And the idea is to be able to control and disrupt that when they want to. Originally, it was the thought was this would be when there was a, a part of a real war. There would be a cyber war and a physical war. But what people have realized is that actually it's happening now. Don't need a physical war for all this to happen, and it's happening now. China, US, Russia, Ukraine, you know, everybody is participating in low-grade cyber warfare against each other. And their targets are your economy. Well, yeah, they go after military secrets, but mostly command and control capabilities of your systems. Can I disrupt your supply chains? Can I disrupt the food on your table? All those things affect your economy, one way or the other, cause distress, stuff like that. So these are the things they're trying to do with the weapons that they've had to make all this money. So that's bad enough, right? And then we make it easier for them because of who we are as developers, right? 
Uh, okay, right. So, any of you got one of these Apple thing, you know, with the detachable? Okay, I'm sure we've all got them around or similar. How many of you have got one with a GSM chip, chip in it? But it's room. This is a mobile phone chip. This is the bit that does the heavy lifting in your phone. For a period of time, these were turning up with these embedded. You think about this. It's plugged into the wall. It's powered, plugged into your computer, right? That means you guard it. It's yours. It's your precious. And it steals all the secrets from your phone. And it's got its own little phone to send things, send them off. It doesn't even have to connect to a network. So this was a spate of this. And this happens a lot. Oh. There are lots of hacking gadgets that you can buy legitimately. Weirdly, there's a lot of hacking gadgets you can buy legitimately, but then you can't use because all uses are prohibited. But that's the way it goes. There's all sorts of gadgets that you can find. Um, there are cables and things. Um, this is a simple one. How many of you, right, got one of these, right, or equivalent, got a USB cable, yes? And you plug it into here, and it's there to charge your phone. Do you know the difference between a data cable and a power cable? Right, because a data cable is the one you plug into your phone to download stuff. The one that you plug into this, the one that you plug into the USB sockets on the wall, better just be a power cable. Because data cables give you access. So when you're in a hotel and you plug it in, what happens? If you've got a power cable, you're safe. If you have a data cable, it might be equivalent of one of these at the back end. Right? The picture up there, how to find hidden cameras in your hotel or Airbnb. Something else that's been going on for a long way is what's physical choreography attacks which means making you sit somewhere of your own free choice to put you in the range of a detection. So in hotels, and this has been going on since the Cold War, it would be make you sit in a place where the cameras could look at your papers or whatever. And this still happens. You still occasionally hear about people finding cameras in hotel rooms. Uh, tip, when you go to a hotel room, see how many places you can sit to comfortably use your laptop. Because if there's only one, Maybe you've got a camera looking over your shoulder. Right? So these are weapons that are traditional weapons that are being used all the time. Right? So there's this, and we need to know about those. And then let's go the other end. Let's go to the let's go to the mail stuff. Phishing. I'm assuming everybody's heard about phishing, and you've all had emails from your work saying, don't get caught by phishing. Right? Because you all get emails like this, don't you? I love this. This, this one came to me um, last year, I think it was, the year before. Brand new 2024 model BMW Hydrogen 7 series car, a check for half a million dollars and an Apple laptop. Right? I get things like this. I've got variations of this one a couple of times. But the fun is, for me, is A, that an Apple laptop is on the same level as half a million US dollars. Cool. And that apparently there's this other thing. Okay, right. But you don't fall for it, do you? No, of course you don't fall for it. Uh, what about one like this? What about one that comes from your boss who you don't like, you're a bit scared of, mm -hmm. and the boss says, I'm doing this thing. Go pay this. Don't talk to me. Now, would you fall for that? Depends how well crafted it is, doesn't it? But you get the difference between this and the one before is about the audience. Those phishing ones that you get, the Nigerian scams, they're not aimed at you. I hope they're not aimed at you because they're aimed at the stupid, greedy people. There's no point trying to get money out of somebody if they're as smart. You want to get money out of the people who are stupid and gullible. So that's why it's like that. You see through it. It's intended to not get you. This one gets more crafted because this one comes from data that they've gleaned from what you say on Facebook. You share your thoughts and it gets picked up. Guess what? AI is starting to do this. So let's add the AI piece into this. This is about AI, obviously. So phishing, 
those idea of trying to scam you by giving putting something in front of you a full four get they're very sophisticated but now we've moved beyond so i have a bunch of examples here so here's the first one um fraudsters used ai to mimic ceo's voice take seven seconds of your voice to be able to synthesize your voice to say anything right cyber criminals call this guy uh, to be somebody else, made stuff happen, right? Easy as pie. Let's see if this works. Speechify has revolutionized my productivity with its custom text-to-speech voices. Partnering with Speechify allowed me to clone my own voice, making it... So, uh, online tool you can go use, I just did it, read what it said, got a voice that sounds almost like me, and that was for free. Then what you can do with more professional tools. So voices are very easy to clone, don't know very much data, and suddenly they're being used against us. And that Zoom call you're on with everybody, hey, there's a load of people on it, it must be real. Well, it's turning out that in a multi-person conference call, everybody was fake. Can you imagine that? You phone up, now maybe they're not people you know, Maybe you're part of something, but there's all these people and you trust the fact that they're real, but they're not. And they could be live, um, it could be live fakes, right? They have to be recorded. I'll show you some of those in a minute, right? This is the level of capability that the bad guys now use are using AI for. We're just beginning, but believe me, it's easy to do. Because we've moved on a long way. If we go back to 2021, let's see if this will work. Come on, play. No. Okay. Let's try this one. I only drink deep gas. You know, it's a live it's like a slap in the face for all I need. Like this? Yeah. Feels really good. You pack quite a wall. You guys, I think I see Tom Cruise. Stop try and stop that. Still got it. And that one. Stop. Which is the real one? This one? This one? This one? They're all fake. And you should tell they're all fake because they all come from here. Deep Tom Cruise, right? There's a fake channel on TikTok. There are hundreds of these, right? And how do you think this works? Right? It turns out to be really easy competitively. What you have is you have somebody who looks figuratively like Tom Cruise. So there's actually an actor not sure if it's a failed actor since he's impersonating somebody else, um, who does that. And then they can apply Tom Cruise's fake onto the video, so post-production video effect, which is why you can have that interaction, okay? That takes a lot of setup, yes? Takes a lot of effort to do that. How about this? Let's see if we can get this one to work. Uh, Yo, I'm a paparazzi. I don't play no Yahtzee. I go pop, 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 pop. My camera's up your crotch. See, I tell the truth from what I see and sell it to Perez Hilti. Don't call me scud. Is this real? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Definitely real. Okay. Why did I pick this? Well, two things. One is it's awesome. <laughs> and two, you can tell it's not real because it's the Mona Lisa. But think what's happening here. They took a still, one frame, and turned it into this. Actually, if you look and watch the video, you can see, there's a, you can go Google for it, because this comes from Microsoft's latest toy. Go play with it, and you can see what is possible. This is a melding of a video, obviously you may recognize the actress, and an image, and it synthesizes it. Right. Now, this is all what you can do out of the box. 
You can go get this stuff. Pay a bit of money, you've got this stuff. But look at what that means. Imagine that's your boss. I can synthesize his voice. I need one picture of him. And the next thing you know, you're having a Zoom conversation. right? And you may not know. You're having a phone call. You can't tell. And you add that with what they do. Um, sorry, I'm just confused. Uh, you add that with what they're now beginning to do in terms of the investigations, it starts to get really scary. Because they're after you. It's what you know, your knowledge, your interactions, what you know about your company. That information is valuable because it lets them in. It could be anything, but they're beginning to, to, to track these things down. So for some reason, I have this slide twice. I'm not sure why I have it twice. Yo, I'm a papa rod! Cool, right. How easy is it to do? Incredibly easy. NVIDIA have lots and lots of GPUs. Uh, gamers, you've got anybody got PC gaming? Yeah, yeah, and you've got probably got NVIDIA or, or uh, AMD, or whatever, and you've got a um, um, card about that th that long and as thick as you're willing to spend. But that's about that size, yeah. Uh, server GPUs weigh as much as a Panda. They are enormous. The size of small, very small cars. They are very, very powerful devices. You can buy rent time on those. This is slightly old, but I've got one of these. It's a Coral from Google, I think it was. It's a TPU. So it's designed to do neural network processing. You plug it into your laptop or your, or my edit plugged into a Raspberry Pi. And it has, gives you enormous amount of heavy lifting to do this stuff. Right? This is really scary. It's very, very easy to get hardware. And you'll have seen Amazon, not Amazon, Apple have just announcing more and more um, ARM processors that are designed for this. You can buy the capability to do AI because we all want to do AI, don't we? Because all of us are being asked by our business to figure out how to connect chat, chat GPT or something to our data. And so you're looking at the stuff and so are the bad guys. Right. The models that these guys use could come from here. Hugging Face is a big repository of documentation and models and all sorts of stuff, right? And you can download things and be very productive very quickly, right? So that's cool. There's all the stuff there, right? So that's great. But models can be dangerous, right? Not just in... Um, ways that you expect, but also in their behavior, because uh, they can be exploited. Uh, so this is this one was from Zscaler, security port. Um, and this is there now we're looking at what types of challenges are we facing. So um, I think in one of the slides, there's an OWASP list as well. So we're beginning to classify the types of things. And some of these I'm going to talk about. All right, so we talked about phishing campaigns. Deep fakes you've seen, social engineering, got one of those. Polymorphic, well, that's interesting. I've got something similar, right? And some of the others are a bit more esoteric, like using API AI to navigate your REST endpoints and figure out how things work by walking through your code because they learn and they are more effective. And the main the other one is where the chatbot doesn't do what you expect. So this is a classic one that's recent, where conversation with a human being and a chatbot for it cost Air Canada some money because it promised things. And the company said, no, no, no. It got taken to court. And it was like, well, it's your software. If you give away free tickets, it's your problem, not, not the user's fault because they talk to your chatbot. Right? Uh, this one is a great example where somebody just tried going into one of these online chatbots, which is there for you to have conversations about um, product. And they said, hey, write me a reverse shell in Python. And it did. The problem we have is that models are black boxes. Right? So 
they're bad in their behavior. When I'm talking about, you know, we'll do another one in a minute. They're also bad when you install them. Hey, here's something as a Java developer you probably even thought of. You go to Hugging Face and you download one of these models, which has no providence, no idea where it came from, no idea what it was trained to do, no idea the data. And with it is a little thing that says, oh, by the way, install some software, Python software. Any Python developers here? Okay, okay. Are you Java developers too? Okay, that's all right then. <laughs> the Java space is a lot safer space for things like malware than a lot of the other spaces because of the way that we have protections built in. There's an architectural protection and there are things like Maven Central. So we're much better at finding malware. Python, unfortunately, has none of those protections. So Python as a space has an enormous amount of malware being pushed up all the time. These are examples in Sanitite because we part of what we do is find this and, and take them down. The point to you is, is that as a Java developer putting your toe in the AI, AI waters, you're now going to be using Python a lot. And Python is a different space. When you install stuff with Python or JavaScript or whatever, you can actually install malware at that point. You don't have that with Java. With Java, you download dependencies. Nothing gets executed. This is a different world. And people make use of the fact that you don't understand that. So, where are we? So, yeah, um, one of the things about models, black bot models, is that they can be what's called poisoned. So, it's a weird thing, because at the end of the day, uh, it's a point of view. So, the idea is, is that I train a model, and that model is, de and I will share you that model. It could be any, it'll be a chat GPT or code generation or whatever. I'm going to create a model and I'm going to put it up on Hugging Face or somewhere and you're going to download it and you're going to use it. And you're going to train it and it's going to look great. And then when you put it in production, bad things happen. So let me say that again. You've got a model pre trained. You train it some more, and because of the way these things are set up, it knows it's in training mode. So what does the model do? The model gives what it was told to do, is like give good answers. But the moment that it goes into production, you now trigger a new mode, which is to do bad things. So that could be um, but the obvious thing is like Copilot. You use Copilot. Anybody using Copilot? I mean, it's it's mostly awesome right you imagine those things where you put in um i want a piece of code and it generates a piece of code during training if you were training it on something new it gave you all the answers in production somebody tries it your customers tries it and it inserts malware right because and these things are undetectable because it's a point of view whether this is behavior is good or bad is completely a point of view so there's no scientific way for us to tell one apart. So that means that every model that you download, that you do not know the providence and you do not how know it was trained, could potentially have this stuff in it. Hey, good now. Uh, AI is also good because it's so good at generating code. Uh, well, when I say so good, it's, it's so, so good at generating code. One of the things that we're discovering it's good at is this wonderful thing, polymorphic malware, self-modifying code. So one of the pinnacles of malware, of viruses and things like that, are code that can't be detected. And one of the ways of not being detected is to do your bad thing and then hide yourself by changing your structure. You can do that, humans can do that, but it's hard work. And when they get it wrong, malware gets discovered because it didn't quite clean up, one of the classic ways. Now we've got proof of concepts of AIs being able to generate the same code. And they can be much better at it because they're machines. So we're seeing that beginning to appear as well. Okay. Okay. Should we go on? You want more? Okay. Right. So there are lots of attacks. There's OWASP has already got a list. You know, it shows you how serious it is when OWASP puts up a list of, of, of things. We could talk about all of some of these others. Some of them are fairly straightforward. 
Um, others are, like I've said, they're, they're a bit subtle, but they all root around the fact that these models are black boxes, right? So there we go. Oh, and NISD, which is the government website, it also has its own beginning get list. So it's not like we're doing nothing, but we're at the beginning of this, like always, and what these things can do are being used by the bad guys much more aggressively than we even we are trying to do in terms of get them as part of the product. Right. Uh, so we are beginning to try things out. So what we're looking for, most of the detection is looking for inconsistencies. There's also a go at trying to create pre-poisoned models so that you can't get what you want out of it. There's this idea of um, training models and poisoning them in, in ways that stop them generating copyright music or whatever. Right? It's a complicated way of trying to get uh, uh, an AI to not do bad things, but that's what they're trying to do. And then the other one is, is in inconsistencies. So let's talk about that. Here is an image which I asked it to create for other reasons. And it's a feeder heat. Can, I want an image of a hose pipe being fed through a letterbox. Don't ask me why, but that was the case. The image is fabulous, apart from, as you've probably seen, the numbers and the fact that there's something weird happening with the host pipe. It's those inconsistencies that get used by uh, AI detection tools. Right? And this is images, but you know that you get the point. It also does it with text as well. Anything, anything that an AI creates is never perfect because it's about how much data it's got available to. So let me explain that as well. This is, uh, you may have seen these. These are like face detection things. These are foundational APIs. This is where you have images that have been labeled by humans, and then you teach an AI to do the mapping. So that when you give it an image, the foundation could go, oh yeah, there's a pattern there. I know that's probably a giraffe, and you get that. So we've all seen that, right? I gave that thing to ChatGPT, and it gave me a great description of what it is. It appears to be a photo featuring African wildlife, wildlife with an overlay of object recognition. And you go, that's awesome, right? It's fabulous. So what I then did was, okay, create me a similar object. And what do I get? Well, the white circles are mine. What I get is a fabulous picture of African animal, animals and a weird set of boxes. And the weird boxes are there because the AI did not have enough training data to be able to simulate it. One AI could spot it, another AI didn't have data. And that's the consistent inconsistencies that we're using to detect those AI fakes, right? The problem that we're having is that every one of those that is an automatic process, of which there are many, literally becomes the next training tool. So we're now in an arms race Right? Because everything that we can automate to detect bad AI now becomes a training tool to make those AI better. Right? So we're in that training mode. Right? Yeah. Are you waiting for the good news? Good. Okay, so that's all the bad stuff. Well, there's a bit more, but there's the bad stuff. What can we do? Now, I can't teach you how to detect bad Zoom calls and stuff like that. That's... We have to figure that out together, right? What I can do is talk to you about where your AI comes into your application and what you can do about that. So there's a little bit here about that, right? Um, so we say this over and over again, but now it's really important. Your software supply chain, which means the process of creating software, how you release it, how you test it, all those aspects, that's called a software supply chain, right? You are used to everything on here, one way or the other. You may not think a lot about some of this stuff, but it's on your thoughts process. What you're getting now is some little red boxes, the courtesy of some governments, that say, hey, you've got to control your AI. Right? You've got to worry about how it's part of your process. You've got to worry about the providence. You've got to worry about how you train it. You've got to worry about legal governance. 
and uh, you've got to worry about how you apply human beings into the process because the only way that you can steer these AIs, much as you can train them, is to have human auditors to make sure that it's reasonable, right? And so all this new stuff is coming down to your pro into your process, uh, and it has consequences, which I'll say in a second. So um, the way the way to think about this, to realize why it's important, is that when we talk about your code, your code is only a fraction of the code that's required to create your application. 10% of your code, whether it's Python, Java, or, or um, AI, is yours. The other rest of it comes from somebody else. You choose dependencies, you choose models, you choose data. That's the vector for bad things getting in, okay? And that's what you've got to defend about. Because, I said more bad news, you know the XZ thing recently? Where they managed to... Okay, so there's really horrible. This guy owns an open source project, says he's getting, he would like to stop doing it and want to do something else, but won't give up. Bad guys figure this out, and they start badgering him to give up, which he does in the end. They take it over, and we get the XZ problem where we could bypass SSH. This is called a sock puppet attack. Sock puppet attack, hence the weird sock puppets. This is the idea is that much as you might get 10 people telling you it's a good idea, none of them are real. This is beginning to be AI'd. This instance isn't, but we're beginning to see hints of this becoming an AI thing. Have you heard of um, Russian brides, Ukrainian brides, this idea that, that um, sad people um, go online, find somebody and have a conversation and they go, I'll oh, give you some money and I'll come visit, you know, and all that, and all that conversation. And they never do because they're with problems, they want more money. That is also beginning to leak into AI. Because why have a human being trying to scam you when you can have a really intelligent chatbot? Right? And hence these things. So our open source code is at more risk than it's ever been because of going back to the beginning to talk about the value that people can get out of it and the fact that uh, they can get in and compromise your systems. So there's stuff going on to make it better from our point of view to reduce the exposure, but it's early days. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on, and this is OpenSSF and others, industry work, is trying to help you quantify choices well, how much data can we give you? So when you download that piece of code, how good is it? How good are the people producing it? Good being, are they good software engineers? And somehow we're going to try and figure out this is going to map into the AI space as well because they have the same problem. Right now, downloading any model off the web, you are completely at your own risk. Unless you can perfectly reproduce that model yourself, you have no idea what it could do. But we're trying to figure out ways to qualify it. And that will turn up, and then hopefully life will get a little better. But in the meantime, there's a lot of AI and non-AI rules turning up from governments. Uh, and like I saw those red boxes, um, if I'm going to sum, sum it up, it's not as bad as it seems. The consequences on some of these laws are nasty. So like the CRA, this, this is the European one. Um, the last time I checked, it was, uh, well, if you, if you get found guilty of breaking the law in that space, it's a percentage of your revenue, and maybe people go to jail, right? Whereas the US ones, it's like you, um, you can't sell to the US government without having uh, done all the things they want. So what they're looking is, is that you demonstrate control over your supply chain whether it's got AI in it or not, right? And the words that you see here, evidence, processes, audit, that's what they're looking for. So think what that means to your audit trail today. Sorry, your audit trail, to your software supply chain. The process that you have to produce software needs to become more regulated because A, you're adding AI in, and now you've got new aspects like Python, 
but also the governments would be coming down on you to do this. And if they're not coming to you directly, they may be coming to people you're a supplier of, and they're going to ask that. We're going to see that. We're going to see large companies going, well, we're going to follow these rules, so we also want our suppliers to do that, which is what you'd expect. So you could, you'll see this coming down as these rules run out and we'll figure out what the right answer is. This is what's coming to you. So it's not an AI thing. It's just a whole bunch of chores. This one, an S-bomb. And have we heard of S-bomb? Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Did Brent where I go? I get quite a range. Right. An S-bomb is effectively a list of materials. Like you have on the side of a box of cereals or whatever. But more specific than the chemicals, it also got traceability. Where did that thing come from? Right. You know, where did the milk come from? Well, the milk came from this cow from this farm on this date. Those sorts of things. S bombs allow us some um, better insight into what our software is made of. And that's going to be very critical in our ability to manage stuff. So when bad things come in, you want to know you've got it so that you can fix it, right? So what you'll see is more of the SCA tools, the software composition analysis tools, um, some of them may disappear entirely because their usefulness is, is not as useful. Uh, others will evolve. The idea is uh, that you need to know what's embedded in your software. Mm -hmm. So... Pretty much all the dependency tools out there, Dependabot and all the others, they're good at working out what's in your list, what's in your Palm or your Gradle or your package.txt. So they can work out that is, and they can go tell you that you've got some vulnerabilities, right? Some more of them are good at looking at the dependencies of the dependencies of dependencies, right? And some of them may even be able to find out where the code has been accidental, or the dependency has been actually accidentally hidden. You know, if you create a fat jar or Uber jar, you can bring in all sorts of stuff and push it together and you can ship it. Now, the only way the receiver of that fat jar could work out what you've got, what you've given them, is either you tell them via, what's, via the SPOM, here's my bill of materials, or they have to use one of these tools to find it. Now, depending which tool they use, they may or may not find all the contents. So they may be at risk because the tool's not good enough. Now, the other thing that SEA tools do, which is sort of beyond this, is, is the malicious stuff, where people have literally taken a class from the bad code, like log for shell was a good example. One of the classes which was instrumental turned up in different packages. Very few dependency tools can find those, right? So your safety going forward is going to be based on the, the ability of these tools. And now we're adding AI into this. A lot of these tools don't know how to use AI. In fact, pretty much none. Maybe a few are beginning to make use of this, but you can see where we're going. So the S-bomb thing, yes. S bombs and a thing called ML bombs, because yes, there's software bomb, but the materials are AIs, are the new words you'll be seeing. And the object is that the tools that we use generate these builds materials at the point where we build it, we package it, whatever. That means you don't have to discover the contents after the fact, which means you don't have to. You, it means we're all a level playing field. You don't have to worry about whether your tool is any good. So one of the things that, you again, you will see going forward is more and more people asking you to put this sort of capability into your build processes for the AI tools and the others and, and just general, okay? They're not joined up is the problem with S-bombs. And I'll show you a picture of how what I mean in a minute. And they certainly are intended to find hidden malicious material. You still have that problem but you are a lot closer to understanding what you've got and what you're given. So you're, the idea is, for instance, that Zoom um, a program that you're all using, you could ask them for an S-bomb, and you could get that scanned to see if they've got vulnerabilities. Right? Anyway, the challenge for us all with this is the S-bombs, though they plug everywhere, so if this is your software deployment lifecycle, whatever, 
every single step of that, there's going to be an S-bomb. Right? And they're not joined up. So the S-bomb that, that comes out of being you compiled, the next step's not going to pick it up. Right? So if you have an S-bomb for your Java application, then you put your Java application inside a container. The container S-bomb is unlikely to list your application's S-bomb details because it doesn't know about them. Because none of these things are joined up. So the net is that for a period of time, we're going to have more and more requirements on us to generate S-bombs, and we're going to have more S-bombs that we know what to do with because there's no one thing that comes out the end that deals with everything. Right? So it means numbers is going to go up. So if you have 150 average dependencies, which is about, for a Java application, you have about 150 average dependencies. Uh, you're going to get 150 supply chains. So every one of those components that you rely on has its own little supply chain. And so that means 150 times however many steps they have in their supply chain. Theoretically, you could be getting for S-bombs. Right. So that was the diversion of the S-bomb thing. I wanted to bring that up because when we look at what preventions we have in, in this space, we can look at AI as an extra thing, but really the same protections apply to anything, whether you take any dependency. There, yeah, obviously with models, you can see that they're, they're more black boxy, so you have less understanding of what's going in. And theoretically with code, you can go check it out. But the future from our point of view, if we split it and go, what are they doing on the social engineering? What are they doing on the tax side? You've seen the sorts of things they're doing. You've just got to be more aware of that. But as a developer, the things that you can start doing now is looking much more about how you create software and how you manage those third-party aspects, assets that come in. Because that's, the, that's your level of protection. That's what you do to keep your business safe. And that's when you start saying, how do we track this stuff? So when, an AI, when you're a Python engineer, downloads a random model from Hugging Face, you now know to go, don't do that. What's the providence? Can I reproduce this model? Can I get the data behind it? Now you can start to ask those questions. And really, it's the same sort of questions that you should already be asking about dependencies. When you select a dependency, you don't just Google for it. Well, I know you Google for it. And you Google for it, and you go, oh, I've got score coordinates, stick it in my palm. What you should be doing is Googling for it, and then going off to the open source project that you found, and try and make some assessment about whether you trust the people who produced it. And remember this, you may trust them today, but they may be hacked tomorrow. So you can't just look at it and go, they look cool today. You know, they haven't got a vulnerability. What you're looking for is, do they do all the right things to prevent that software being um, compromised? Because believe me, there are a bunch of people out there trying to actively compromise the open source tools that you use. Right. So, do you want some more bad news? Was that good enough? I've got one more piece of bad news, right? And then we're done. This guy, who sort of came out of nowhere, has said, hey, you know that AI we're using today? Ha! Compared to, for, well, you can read the coin, right? AI would be laughably bad. What he means is that the capabilities of the AI we're using today are going to be nothing compared to what they plan to give us next year. And if you listen to this guy, some of the videos and things he talks about, he is on his way. He's going for the singularity. Everybody understand what AI singularity means? Yes. So it's up to us whether our AI singularity masters are nice or not nice. Thank you. So any, I've got six minutes, so any questions? You're still here, so it can't be that scary. No? I normally say I'm around for the whole conference, but that's a bit pointless now. I've got a question. Yes. Um, you're talking about S-bombs from, uh, do the build tools that we use, say, you know, 
great old Maven, whatever. Do they generate? That is a very good question. Uh, yeah, so there's a mix. So you, from Maven and Gradle, you can get plugins. Okay. Uh, some of those tools are standalone, but pretty much every single step that you've got, there is a tool for it. So your Docker container is a tool to generate a thing. But as I said, the challenge is that they just look at the bit they've given. So if you look at an SBOM for a Docker container, it just looks at all the packages are installed. If you W get something in, it'll never spot that. So a, a POM.xml is not enough to be an SBOM. It needs to be bigger, more detailed. Um, well, the SBOM will be the transitive list. Yeah. And and with all... So if, if you've you ever tried the effective POM action? No. Okay. So when you're building, when you're building Java with POMs, you've probably got parameters and all sorts of things. So what Maven has to do before it builds, it has to work out what the final POM really looks like. That's called an effective POM. And there are tools to produce that, and that will give you a list of the versions of all of the dependencies and your plugins and stuff. Right? So it's a bit like that, but it's even bigger because it's also every single dependency that your tools and your, de your dependencies need. Other than that, yeah, it's just a list. I need to get a hat. Cool. Okay. okay. Oh. Yes. It's a bit of a clarification of uh, what you said about SBOM. So, for example, we use log files uh, for our greater projects at the moment, and it has a, basically a list of everything for every project and every source set. So, you know, it basically says, okay, this source set for this project has this yep. dependence, and this is the version, right? But uh, you also mentioned that it needs to, you know, specify where it comes from, etc. But uh, lots of places use stuff like you know local artifact or instances, so they pull everything. Like, how deep do we need to go? Okay. Basically, that, that's a very good question. Um, how deep do you go? Well, right now we're not going anywhere as deep as what I just said. What you come up with that list of dependencies is all we've got. But in theory, you should also be saying which repository you downloaded them from. And if you, I have been on a couple of. Uh, government software supply chain meetings in the US over the years and there are some people are telling you that they expect to be able to track back to the compiler that you compiled and also what patches you had installed on your Unix platform because the idea is that you have ultimate tra traceability if anything is discovered to have a bug and it was you're using it or it was used in the production of your software you should know but we're talking generational solutions, right? So I think the answer will be, to start off, will be, can you produce an SBOM in one of the standard formats, of which there are two or three, and that will be good enough. And then as the laws evolve and people see what we can do, because the obvious thing is not to have a tool, a separate tool. The obvious thing is to have the packaging and the compilers and the Docker builds to just spit this stuff out so there's no margin for mistake but yeah but i say yeah so right now we're in bits and pieces but good question um i'd like to know your opinion um going forward let's say in the next five years who do you think has the advantage the good guys or the bad guys oh bad guys uh, uh, <laughs> sorry didn't you see the nine trillion dollars that's that's why the governments are involved they're involved for the money and for the consequences. Right? We're, we, are, we are way behind in getting our act together on this. Right? So we just don't stand a chance in dealing with all of this? Well, you, you just, what do you do? You, you raise your defenses. You get more critical. You stop trusting stuff you download. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 the next time you download an open source project, be a bit more critical, you know. The next time you go, to, you read a piece of news. Be a bit more critical, because they are working on your your innate belief, especially us as open source consumers, that the world is wonderful and and clean and trustworthy, and it's not. And it's and it's not like it's all bad, but there's enough of it out there for you to be vulnerable. So. You just got to be less trusting. It's horrible, but that's what it is. Yeah. See, I told you I'd end this conference on a good note. Yeah. Was there one more? Yes. 
Um, yeah, uh, I was wondering your thoughts on provable languages, because they've always been a real niche. But it seems a lot of the problem is that AI can slip things in there right very easily that can be missed. There's, there's a yeah, rather niche set of languages right that revolve around the fact that if I write this code, I can prove that this will always happen. And I wonder if that could be used as a more rigorous defense, because if I can mathematically prove yeah. and show the um, execution path of my code, then there's no possible way for that to go bad, right? But that would require a huge mindset shift from where we are now. There, there, you're, you wouldn't be the first person to suggest that. It is, it is an academic suggestion. The consequences of that are how do you change a pick a number, $100 billion investment in open source to use these things. But you 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 would not be the first person to suggest that. I mean, they, the other thing the governments are looking at, like memory safety. So that's why you see things like Rust being really important because memory, if you have poor memory safety languages, then they can be compromised. But the, yeah, the provability and stuff like that, um, that's been knocking around for years. It's has always had usually really hard to teach people how to do it or really hard performance problems. But either of those are solvable. We just not had enough need to do it. So maybe it will. I, I don't know. But it's it's not the first time people have brought that up. Yeah. Bye. Right. Thank you. I think we're apparently we're time's up. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>